Welcome. My name is Hubert Savanaya and I'm a hydrologist. We have seen that the hydrological cycle has no start and no end. But generally we say that the terrestrial cycle starts with the precipitation. There are many different types of precipitation besides rainfall. There is of course snow and hail, which is the frozen form of rainfall. Dew is formed by cooling, generally at night as a result of outgoing long wave radiation. While white frost is frozen dew. But there is also glaze ice, or simply glaze, which is undercooled rain that turns into ice as it hits a cold surface. I remember that as a child I could skate on the road. Dew and white frost find their origin in the near ground humidity of the air. It is formed when the Earth's surface cools until the dew point. Just like we saw in the saturation vapor pressure curve in the previous section. But rainfall, snow and hail, as everybody knows, falls from the clouds. Now how is this process triggered? As in the case of dew, droplets formation is governed by the saturation pressure curve. Clouds are formed by supersaturation, which happens when moisture is cooled below the dew point. Cooling is caused by the lifting of air. As a volume of air is lifted, the pressure drops, and hence the temperature. The average lapse rate is 6.4 degrees Celsius per kilometer elevation. Condensation requires little crystals or dust particles for nucleation. Turbulence causes the droplets to grow, as drops move up and down, and collide with other droplets, until they are too heavy to be sustained by turbulence or the uplift of the air and they drop to the ground. So we see that cooling is essential. And we also noticed that clouds are formed by rising air. What can be the causes of rising air? There can be several. And all of them have different characteristics. There is convection by thunderstorms. Orographic effects near mountain ranges. And then we have tropical cyclones, hurricanes or typhoons. Do you know what the difference is between them? Well, there is no difference. It is just that their names are linked to the different oceans that generate them. The Indian Ocean has cyclones, the Pacific has typhoons, and the Atlantic has hurricanes. Here you see a movie of the Hurricane Katrina, which caused havoc in New Orleans. And then there are the monsoons, governed by the difference in cooling between land and ocean in the tropics, causing sea breezes that carry moist air inland. In temperate areas, there are depressions that cause cold and warm fronts to rotate over land. Because cold air is heavier than warm air, a cold front forces itself under the warm air and the moist warm air and causes an uplift, which can trigger heavy thunderstorms. A warm front generally moves over the colder air and triggers less intensive rainfall. As a result, we see very different amounts of precipitation distributed over the world. From very large amounts in Cherapunji, at the foot of the Himalayas, fed by the monsoons, to very small amounts in the arid zones of the Arabian Peninsula. It is fun to look at the world records of precipitation. Here we plot the maximum depths of precipitation recorded in the world as a function of their duration. We see that the orographic lifting in the foothills of the Himalayas, under the influence of the monsoons, triggers the highest amounts of long duration rainfall. A maximum of about 20 meters per year in Cherapunji. Just try to imagine how much rainfall that is. The tropical cyclones cause the largest amounts on a daily time scale. In La Réunion, in the Indian Ocean, we recorded about 2 meters per day. 
You could drown by just standing in the rain on a flat terrain. At shorter time scales, we go to the thunderstorms. We have a world record of about 200 millimeters in 10 minutes in South Germany and on Jamaica. Imagine that a bucket standing in the rain would fill up with water in 10 minutes. Of course, not all places in the world can have these records. The second line corresponds with the records of the UK rainfall. And in the Netherlands, where I'm from, we have very modest amounts of rainfall compared to other places in the world. You see them indicated by the stars. Yet, I have the feeling that it rains a lot here in the Netherlands. We have 180 rain days per year. How do we measure precipitation? There are many devices. The most traditional is the regular funnel-shaped tube, which you empty once per day. You read the volume, divide it by the surface area, and record the amount of rainfall per day. Other devices make use of weighing, optics, acoustics, or a tipping device. This is such a tipping device. When, when one side is full, it tips, and then the other side fills, etc. Be aware, a lot can go wrong with these instruments. I once had a hornet's nest in it, which blocked the tipping device. But this applies to all the devices mentioned. A lot of things can go wrong. Sometimes because they break down, and sometimes because the reader does not know what to do. Or sometimes because they are positioned under a tree or in the shade of a house. Moreover, all these instruments provide point observations in space. And we have to be aware that rainfall can vary considerably in space. This is an example of the many new remote sensing products that are becoming available. They measure rainfall on the basis of radar, microwave, and the temperature of the clouds. The picture shows how variable the rainfall is, and that point observations can give a wrong impression of the average precipitation that fell over a region. There are other new and innovative ways of precipitation measurement, such as land-based radar, information from GSM booster stations, and using the speed of cars as a function of the weather, or the speed of their screen wipers. There is still a lot of information around that we can use. Precipitation has a number of characteristics that we have to distinguish very well. Watch out, because not everybody does this. Firstly, there is the intensity. Precipitation being a flux, the intensity is the measure of the flux. But it depends on the duration of the rainfall. In general, we can say that if the duration is longer, the intensity is lower. We'll come back to that. Second is the depth. This is the integral of the intensity over a certain duration t. It is expressed as a length, for instance, in millimeters. But be aware, this integral is meaningless without the duration, because precipitation is and remains a flux. Many people, even meteorological officers, make mistakes in this regard. For instance, they say that the rainfall was 100 millimeters. But this is meaningless if you don't men mention the time over which this 100 millimeter was accumulated. So always present precipitation as a flux. P is D over T. Then there is the frequency of the probability of occurrence. A rainfall event always has a probability of occurrence. This is the more important when we speak of extreme precipitation. Finally, there is the aerial extent of the event. This is extremely important if we want to interpret a point observation of precipitation. The hiatograph is the Greek word to describe the graph of the rainfall intensity as a function of time. The mass curve is the integral of this curve, and the precipitation over the duration t is found by connecting two points on the curve a distance t apart. The maximum intensity corresponds with the steepest slope of the mass curve. 
The aerial extent of an event is described by the aerial reduction curve. If we look at a very extreme precipitation event observed at a certain spot, then we may assume that around it the event was less extreme. Generally, it reduces according to some Gaussian distribution, reflecting the size of the event. It can be described by a Gauss-like equation of the maximum intensity P max, the area A and two parameters K and N. Here I show some of these curves derived by an engineering consultant company for Bangkok and Jakarta. We can see that the distribution is flatter for longer duration events. Which seems logical, because these are larger systems. Finally, we briefly mentioned four engineering tools used to average precipitation in space. Most common is the Thyssen network, a way to visualize the nearest neighbor. But another way to favor the nearest neighbor is by inverse distance. A more accurate but more elaborate way is using the isohyets, the lines of equal rainfall amounts. But more advanced, more advanced is the use of geostatistics, the so-called creeging method. Here we see some isohyets for Thailand and the Thyssen network for the city of Bangkok. In the exercise, you can see how these methods are applied in practice. If you have many point observation data, then it is sometimes hard to assess the consistency of the data. As I said, many things can go wrong in the measurement and the processing of precipitation data. A simple way of identifying stations with problems is to plot double mass curves. In this example, on the horizontal axis, we see the accumulated means of a number of stations plotted against the accumulated values of a single station. If something is wrong with that station, it may show a haphazard pattern or a kink in the line when something changes around that station. Here you see a few double mass plots of Bangkok again. They look reliable, although the right one has some deviations around 1978. For engineering practices, we need to be able to relate precipitation intensity to its duration and frequency. For instance, to determine the pumping capacity of a polder, or to find a critical precipitation event to design a bridge or a culvert. For that, we follow the following procedure. We have to start with looking at a record of daily rainfall, assuming we have 50 years of records, totaling 365 days times 50 years is 18,262 daily values. We then count the number of days when more than 0, 10, 20, 30 or more millimeters depth, you can also take smaller classes depending on the purpose, are achieved. You do the same for amounts falling in two days, five days and ten days. This results, for instance, in this table. We see that only once in 50 years the daily intensity exceeds 40 millimeters per day, a probability of 2 percent on an annual scale. Similarly, an intensity of 30 millimeters per day is exceeded 5 over 50 years, whereby T is 10. For the two days precipitation, 60 millimeters is exceeded two times during 50 years. T is 25. We can plot these data in a graph. On the vertical axis, I plotted the logarithm of the return period, T, and horizontally the depth in millimeters. In the black squares, we see the points where an event of 40 millimeters per day has a return period of 50 years and an event of 30 millimeters per day with a return period of 10 years. Similarly, we see the point where 60 millimeters in two days has a return period of 25 years. We can rework these curves in the following graphs. We can plot the depth against the duration for different return periods and 
on a normal scale on the left or on a log scale on the right. Or we can plot the intensity against the duration for different return periods also on a normal scale on the left or a log scale on the right. Such graphs are extremely useful to design the drainage of parking lots, pumping capacities of polders, or design discharges for culverts and bridges. Here's a graph for Bangkok, which was used to design the drainage of the city on the right bank of the Chao Pia. Now that we have looked into the characteristics of evaporation and precipitation, it is time that we start to look at the third component of the water balance, the runoff. See you later.